Hello, friend. Good to have you with us today. We've been talking about three important seasons. It's important to distinguish what season you're in so that you, you can respond the right way. We talked about a season of trials. Some of you have been there. I, we've all been through a few of them. We're going to move on right now and talk to another season that the scriptures talk about. And I pray that God give you understanding in the word as we study it together today. If you've got a Bible, grab it. Let's get into the word. Ezekiel 34, verse 23. It says, I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. My servant David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with them. And cause wild beasts to cease from the land, and they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I will make them and the places all around them, or all around my hill, a blessing. And I will cause showers to come down in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. Now, as always, when a prophetic utterance was given, there was a lot of layers to it. It applied to God's people then. It applies to us as God's people today. And the people of God had been scattered in that time because of leaders, spiritual leaders that were more interested in feeding themselves and manipulating in order, you know, so that they could move themselves forward as opposed to, to feeding the flock. And God got angry, says, this is going to stop. And uh, God talked about what he was going to do, and then he said he's going to set up a shepherd over them, even David. Well, when Ezekiel said this, David had been dead for 400 years. So he obviously wasn't talking about literally setting up David, but he was looking into the future and prophesying about Christ because King David is a type of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the one shepherd that God has set over the flock. And he talked about them, you know, being able to sleep safely in the wilderness and the, the wild beast being gone. And it's just the picture of tranquility and peace and security and safety, the things that come to us when we embrace Christ. So Ezekiel, though, he was speaking by the Spirit of God to some things that were actually going on then, you know, some injustice, and God saying, listen, I love my people, and I will only put up with them being, you know, trampled on and taken, you know, taken advantage of for so long. I'm going to step in, and so he did. But layered in that, there was a prophecy for us about Jesus Christ coming and being the great shepherd. And Jesus himself said, I am the great shepherd of the sheep. The hireling flees when he sees the wolf coming, but the good shepherd, he lays his life down for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. So Jesus is that shepherd, and he brings us peace, and he brings us safety. So Ezekiel was prophetically speaking about us and our time and our dispensation. And in connection with that, he makes this statement, he gives this promise that I'll make the places all around my hill a blessing. I'll cause showers to come down in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. Now, it refers in type to the coming of the Holy Spirit and His reviving influence. And elsewhere in the Scripture, the Holy Spirit is typed as, you know, a shower of rain coming down, causing things to be fruitful and to grow and bringing refreshing. But there's a literal fulfillment as well of physical, tangible blessing. Just as showers in their season, if they would come, the early and the latter rain to that land that God's people lived in then, it would bring prosperity to the land. It would cause the crops to grow. It would cause the fruit to become ripe. It would bring bountiful harvest. And they measured their prosperity and their blessing in those ways because they lived in an agrarian society. And thank God we have the reviving influences of the Holy Spirit in our life, and He has been sent. He has come down. But there are also physical, literal blessings that the Holy Spirit brings to us. There are seasons of prosperity and opportunity that can never be achieved on our own. And this promise actually alludes to that as well. 
showers coming down in their season, showers of blessing. How many could stand a season of blessing? Yeah. Well, for those of you that didn't raise your hand, you can just listen and... How many would like to be blessed? Let me tell you why. He actually sets it off at the beginning here, the reason for it. In verse 26, he said, I will make them and the places around my hill a blessing. I will make them a blessing. And then he said, showers will come down. There will be showers of blessing, seasons of blessing. But first he said, I'm going to make them a blessing. That is God's primary reason for making us a blessing is so we can be a blessing. God told Abraham, I will bless you, and you shall be a blessing. And God says, I will make them, talking about his people, you know, the flock of his pasture, the people that are in this dispensation with Jesus Christ as their great shepherd. He's going to make us a blessing. And then these showers of blessing are going to come, and these seasons of blessing are going to come. But he sort of sets the principle at the beginning. Yes, he wants to bless us. Yes, he will bless us. But he wants us to realize that we're not just blessed for ourselves. We're blessed to be a blessing. And I do believe that there are seasons or times of exceptional blessing that come from God, and they should not be taken for granted. You should look with me in the New Testament in Luke's Gospel, the, or excuse me, not Luke, Acts chapter 3. Acts, the third chapter. Peter here is preaching Pentecost. A bunch of people have gotten saved, and he's giving an explanation for what's going on. And Acts chapter 3, pick it up in verse 19. He said, repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that word times is seasons. Literally, specifically appointed times and seasons, special seasons, so that the seasons of refreshing can come from the presence of the Lord. Let's read on. And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the, world, since the world began. So Peter here talks actually about three different things. He talks about the return of Christ, hasn't happened yet. He talks about a specific time for the restoration of all things, and God is going to make a new heavens and a new earth. That hasn't happened yet. And he also talked about times or seasons of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. And notice he made it plural. Times, seasons, plural, of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. He says, repent, get your heart ready, be right with God, so it, when these seasons do come, you can benefit from them. And the word refreshing there literally means a time to catch your breath. A time to recoup and to grow and, and rest and catch your breath, a time where you're out of the fight. Now, does anybody in here ever feel or have you felt or perhaps you're feeling like it's just one wave after another comes and you feel like you're going down for the third time and you think if one more financial thing hits me, I don't know what in the heck I'm going to do. And there are times you can't even catch your breath because of stuff that's happening. You know, this, this trial happens, and, and then this money that we use for that is going out that way, and then you've got a battle over here and a battle over there, and it seems like wave after wave after wave, and you can't catch your breath. Well, you know what? There is a promise here, just like we read in Ezekiel, and I think they're tied together, that there will be seasons of refreshing, showers of blessing that come. There will be seasons of times where you can, you know, back up and you're not having to fight on five different fronts where you can just grow and you can resupply. And you know, the church went right into one of these seasons, if we read in the book of Acts. It was a time of extravagant giving. 
and supernatural supply for the early church, if you read in the, the, the following chapters. It was a time of amazing favor. Even with those that did not believe, the Bible says the church had favor with all of the leaders in the community, even the ones that didn't believe in Christ. It was a time of radical salvations and supernatural healings that took place. And that season lasted for a while, and it did come to an end, as all seasons do. And then there was persecution, and the favor was no longer there as it had once been, and the, the, the abundance that was coming in so much, they were, having, they were having problems. You know, they're having to delegate people to just distribute things. It was a time of, of, of great supply. But that season ended, and, and, you know, hopefully looking back, that early church did a good job of stewarding that time. And I honestly believe that right now, as a church, we're in the edges of one of those seasons of refreshing. I really believe it. A season where we're going to see more extravagant giving and supernatural supply and radical salvations and, and amazing, you know, indescribable favor that you could never curry yourself, you know, through human ingenuity. And we want to do our best to be good stewards of that season. Now, don't get me wrong, though. God is good all the time, isn't he? He's good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. He makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. But there are special seasons of blessing. And it seems to me, you know, having been around the block a few times and seen seasons come and seasons go, I've seen seasons of just amazing, you know, jaw-dropping blessing where, where things were happening and you're going, this, this is amazing. And then I've seen seasons where, all right, we, didn't ha we don't have that flow that we once did and it's one foot in front of the other and we're going to be faithful and God's going to be good and he supplied the needs, but there wasn't that, that, that level of blessing and that, in that level of intensity. Seen, seen a lot of that come and go in nearly 40 years. But I have noticed that when those seasons of blessing, when those seasons of refreshing are on, that the richer, more frequent blessings come to those that do something. During those seasons, everybody gets wet with the rain. Everybody gets a little bit. But there are some that seem to garner the richer and more frequent blessings during those seasons. And I'm going to say it again, and, and, you know, I'm accountable to God for making statements like this. I believe that as a church, we're in the edges of one of those seasons now. Amen. Look with me in the book of Galatians, if you would. I want to show you what that thing that I've noticed that people do that I believe brings those richer and more frequent blessings into their life. The book of Galatians, chapter 6. In verse 9, it said, says, And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, everyone say due season. For in due season, when, when that season comes, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. I think those seasons of blessing come due more often to those who consistently sow, to those who seize the opportunities afforded them to do good. Did you notice in verse 9, he said, let us not grow weary while doing good. And then in verse two, 10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good. Everybody say, do good. In fact, tap your neighbor and say, do something good. Two times he said, do good, do good, take the opportunity. And then look at verse 7, and here's the key. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. If you do good, when those seasons uh, where, where God is doing things come due, you will reap the richer blessings in your life. And I think many people stand before a field that they've planted no seed in whatsoever, and they pray to God for a miracle harvest. 
And God is good. I mean, God is gracious. He's good to the, the good and the evil. The rain on the you know, just and the unjust. We, we know that's God's character and nature. But you know, there, there comes a time when you need to have the field planted with sowing good into someone else's life if you're expecting to reap those same good things in your life. Get some seed in the ground. And I was on the phone one day to a friend where I'm driving actually to the, to the church office and he said, Baylis, you know, an amazing thing happened. He said, I was just at this event, you know, his kid was involved in this sporting thing and he said, I was there and we were having like this big barbecue and I met this guy, you know, his kid is involved in there. He's not a believer, but we hooked up and there's just this, this synergy there. He says, and I began to talk to him and he opened up and I talked to him about Christ and, and it, he said, it, we just had the best time, and he asked questions, and I was really just, just able to, to share my testimony with him, and my friend had been a really bad boy and gotten radically saved, and so he shared his testimony, and, and he just gets finished telling me this, this long story of how he's ministered to this guy for, for a, a long time, and the guy was just showing you know, a real sensitivity and a hunger for the things of God. I said, man, I, I got to go. I'm at the office, so I hang up. I walk in the office, and here's the sister standing there of the man that my friend was just telling me about. And she's at the office. I haven't seen her in a year, haven't spoken to her in a year. She's at the office. She has this big bag, basket of homemade goodies, and she's giving them to everybody in the office. She, she, and she just said, I just wanted to do something good. You know, you guys, you, you serve the church so faithfully, you serve us so faithfully, and I just felt like I wanted to do something good for you. And she gives me a big portion of this basket, and there was some really cool stuff in there. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is too much. I said, you know what? I just got off the phone right now, five seconds before I walked in the door and ran into you, and I was talking to a friend, and he was just witnessing to this guy and sharing with him, and I said, and guess who it was? He said, he was talking to your brother. She said, oh, my God, God is so good. And I thought, yeah, he is. But I look at you, and you're doing good, especially to those of the household of faith, and no wonder you're reaping good in your life. It was like an instantaneous illustration of what I'm talking about. Do good as you have opportunity. And he said, especially to those who are of the household of faith, especially to God's family. God loves his kids. You know, someone does something good for your kids and you want to bless them, don't you? God feels the same way. He loves his family. I was in Australia preaching at a big conference years ago. And one of the guys that had actually given up a few days of work said, look, I'm going to volunteer. I want to be a driver. I've asked for the time off. And, and, and I, I want to be able to drive guest speakers and just serve the house. And so he did... But like right beforehand, and, and the church actually provided cars. There was a, a local car dealership said, look, you know, you guys, you can use our cars. And so they would give the cars for free that they would drive the guest speakers. And the, like the day or two days before, maybe a week before, his car had been stolen. We're talking Sydney, Australia, four million people in the city. Very, very slim chance his car will ever be recovered. It's been gone for a week or whatever, and so... He's there, he's taking a guest speaker off to a far part of the city where he would never normally be, and he's driving back, and he looks at the car in front of him, and it's his car. <laughs> so he follows it, gets on his mobile phone, calls the police, and said, look, my star car was stolen a week ago, I reported it, and I'm following it right now. <laughs> they said, where are you? And he went, the guy parked, and he sort of parked down the street, and the cops came, and he got his car back, and the only thing that had been done to it, if I remember correctly, is they'd installed a brand new stereo in it. <laughs> and I just think, you know, what are the chances of that four million people in the city, and you just happen to be at that moment, at that part of the city that you never would have been before, and here you get your car back with, with a brand new stereo in it. <laughs> well, you know, he was saying, you know, I want to do good for God's house and for God's family, to those of the household of faith, and he was reaping good in his own life. I have a friend that has more miraculous things happen to him with finances than you can imagine. I mean, amazing, astonishing things that you just, you just shake your head and say, you're kidding me. You're not making this up, are you? And these things happen pretty regular to him, and they got God's fingerprints all over them. And some people say, why him? I'll tell you, I know one reason, because he's very quick to do good for others. 
In fact, he is the single most generous person that I've ever met, especially when it comes to blessing those of the household of faith. And I think he reaps in due season, when those seasons come, he reaps the richer and more frequent blessings because he's always seizing the opportunities to do good. Now, I don't know what this season's going to look like before it's done. Don't know how long it's going to last. But I do believe with all of my heart that we're in that season of refreshing. A time, you know, for some it's like economically I'm going to be able to catch my breath. Others, it's, it's in other arenas. You know, there's just favor and blessing and goodness that, that come from God. But to capitalize on it, I think we need to embrace that principle that Ezekiel talked about. God started by saying, I'm going to make you a I will make them a blessing. And the showers of blessing, there are going to be seasons of blessing. And showers of blessing are going to come down. But before he said that, you know, he set the whole tone. There'll be a blessing. Now, I, for one, want to be blessed. I truly do. I've got some needs that I'm trusting God to meet in, in my own life. But before that, I want to set my heart, God, I want to be the answer to somebody else's prayer. And you know, I honestly think God looks to the body of Christ. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose hearts are fully his. And I think when it comes to seasons like this, God is, yes, he's looking to bless people because he wants to bless us. But I think he's also looking for people that have the heart that says, God, I don't just want a blessing, but I want to be the blessor. I want to be the one that blesses somebody else. And I think in a few moments we can maybe just respond to that, just an outward way to say, God, if, if, if you're in it, you feel it's something in your heart that you want to do, that we can say, God, you know, I want to be blessed, but in all earnestness, I, I, I want to be the one that gives a blessing. But I want to warn you before we get to that, that moment, and it'll be a couple minutes from now, God will test your heart. The scripture says God does test our hearts. And if you read the ways that God tests people's hearts, sometimes he asks them to give things away that are very important to them. Not just necessarily something of great monetary value, but he puts his fingers on things in our lives and says, will you let go of that if I ask you to? And I think sometimes when you know, people say, yeah, I'm, I'm in, I, I, I want to be a blessing. God says, okay, you have $30, I want you to give 28 of it away. Well, God, can't we like have this thing start when I get $2,800? <laughs> God will say, next. So just, just a word of warning. God deals with us where we are. He wants us to be extravagant and generous. Wh whatever season you know, we're at in our life and whatever you know, level we're at, we always have to start where we are. Not saying, well, God, if, once I get here, man, I, I'm in. I'm, I'm going to be that person that just let me win the lottery. And God, you, you've got your man. You've got your girl. I'm going to be a source of blessing to the church. God says, well, you know what? I'll tell you what. If I can trust you with the $20 you have now to do what I say with it, then maybe I can trust you with $40 later on. Just bow your heads. Close your eyes for a minute. The greatest blessing that comes into anyone's life is when they accept the Savior, Jesus Christ. Ezekiel, looking to the future, saw people in his day scattered, wounded, distraught, vulnerable. And through the Spirit of God, God said, I'm going to set up a leader over them, and this is going to end. But he was looking to our time. Looking at, at humanity as a whole, scattered and bruised and forsaken and isolated. And he has sent a shepherd, Jesus Christ. The shepherd of our souls. Died on the cross for our sins, raised from the dead for our justification. And if you've not made him the shepherd of your life, you need to do it. He died and he's been raised from the dead. 
And the Bible says he's rich to all who call upon him. The scripture also says the one who calls upon him will not be disappointed. The Bible also says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be rescued, will be saved. I want to invite you to pray with me right now. Wherever you are, you may have come in with a friend and had a gaping emptiness in, in your life. You've tried to fill with everything. You've tried to fill it with sex and relationships, even deviant sex. You've tried to fill it with drugs or alcohol. You've tried to fill that empty place inside with ritual or with money or things it can only be filled by God and we only come to God through His Son Jesus. Jesus is the bridge. Jesus is our access, access point to the Father. He said no one comes to the Father except through me. I want to pray a prayer right now. If you're a prodigal that needs to come home or someone making this decision for the first time, open your heart and pray with me. God won't turn you away. I'd like the whole congregation to pray right, right now. Just say, oh God, I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died upon the cross for the sins of the whole world. I believe he died for my sins to rescue me, to bring me into the family, to bring me into the fold. Jesus, I call you Lord. I ask you to be the shepherd of my life. I put my trust in you alone. In your name I pray. Amen. God does bless us to make us a blessing. He doesn't bless us so that we can hoard it up, but so that it can flow through us, that we can be a channel of blessing to others. And I just want to encourage you with an opportunity to be a blessing to someone else. If the Answers broadcast has been significant in your life in any way, I want to encourage you to, to join with us in taking the broadcast to others. We actually air in hundreds of countries around the world in multiple languages. And I think some people just assume we've got all sorts of money, you know, because we don't get on and, and ask for money. Well, we, we have to trust God continually for the finances to carry on with what we're doing. And uh, as people like you share with us, it enables us to carry the mission forward. So why not become a partner? Why, why not become a part in what we're doing and take the broadcast to someone else in need? Use the blessing that God has brought in your life to in turn bless someone else. Please contact us, be a part, and let's help other people find this wonderful Jesus that we've come to know.